So in 13 through 16, there's a kind of reunion that's happening of Odysseus to his native land, but it's happening in fits and starts. He's constantly lying. He's telling people uh, half-truths and full lies. Uh, he's making connections with people, but not quite his own inner circle yet. Well, that's, this changes in book 16. He does have an actual reunion uh, that comes with someone in his inner circle. He uh, gets reunited with his own son, Telemachus, in quite a moving scene. Uh, the beginning of 16 as it starts is quite, quite interesting stuff, isn't it? Uh, there's a wonderful simile uh, that starts this book off. I thought we'd take a chance to, to take a look at this. Um, Homeric uh, similes, uh, Homer uses similes to tremendous effect through the poems uh, in both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, in, uh, they work slightly differently in each epic. In the Odyssey, uh, what we often get is a way for um, the characters in the story to change places. They get compared to things that seem like other characters should be being compared to. And so connections are drawn among the characters inside the story. Let's take a look at this example. Um, Telemachus comes home. And when he does, we hear Odysseus looking at him and thinking about him. And then the narrative seamlessly moves in this direction, straight to the prince. He rushed and kissed his face and kissed his shining eyes, both hands as the tears rolled down his cheeks. As a father brimming with love welcomes home his darling only son in a warm embrace, what pain he's borne for him and him alone. Home now in the tenth year from far abroad, so the loyal swineherd hugged the beaming prince. He clung for dear life, covering him with kisses, yes, like one escaped from death. Now, what has Homer done in the simile? Well, we got into it quite subtly. It's a little bit hard to tell at the very beginning who's the one who's running straight to the prince and kissing him. It seems like it could be Odysseus. Welcoming, welcoming him like a father welcomes someone home who's been gone for a long time. Well, look what's happened here. Homer has put uh, Eumaeus in the place of Odysseus. So Eumaeus here gets to be the father figure that Homer is not quite ready to have Odysseus be. Um, Odysseus still needs to keep his distance, keep far away. Um, Telemachus gets to get reconciled with a kind of father figure here via the simile, uh, but in this case it's Eumaeus. So Eumaeus gets a chance to play Odysseus here. But then also, read a little bit further, it's as though in a subtle way Telemachus gets a chance to be Odysseus too, because when Eumaeus welcomes him home. He welcomes him home like someone who's been gone for 10 years from far abroad, uh, long away uh, and being far abroad uh, in, in, in far away voyages. So Telemachus, although he hasn't been gone for 20 years, uh, he's been gone for 10. It's in a way he's compared to Odysseus's 10, uh, at least the 10 years of Odysseus's absence uh, where he himself is far away. So each character gets a chance to kind of step into the shoes of the other and they show some really wonderful connections between them. Now, uh, Eumaeus at that point goes off on his mission and Odysseus to bring messages to Penelope and Odysseus is alone with Telemachus. Uh, at that point, Athena leaves and notice what she does when she leaves. She gives a kind of wink. She not, gives a nod and uh, wrinkles her eyebrows over at Odysseus as if, hey, now's the time. This wink back and forth between them, secret sign, a secret conveyance of information between Athena and Odysseus. Telemachus doesn't see her. Telemachus is not in on it yet. Odysseus is involved in his own circle of knowledge with Athena, Telemachus in, in a different circle of knowledge that is not overlapping. Soon enough, these two are going to overlap, but for now, uh, they're in slightly different worlds. At that point, Odysseus reveals himself to Telemachus, um, and the revelation of father to son is abrupt. It's not gradual. Eumaeus, it's going to take a long time for Odysseus to come back and get ready to get to know him. But with uh, Telemachus, he jumps right out, and, and he's ready to show himself uh, to Telemachus. Telemachus is confused, doesn't realize, wait a minute, it can't really be you. Um, and then they just uh, break down and have a wonderful, tender embrace. Uh, Telemachus quickly mistakes Odysseus for a god. And just like Odysseus did when he washed up on Scyria, his, he is quick to say, no, 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 I'm not a god. No, 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 I'm not a god. When, Odi when a, a, a hero is identifying him or herself, what the hero does first is to disclaim a divine uh, aspect. That shows great deference to the divinities. Uh, you've got to say, no, 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 I'm not more than I am. I'm just a human being. Uh, to Odysseus does that just as he does um, on the island of Scyria. After the long, tender embrace uh, and tears uh, wetting the ground, Odysseus is ready for business. Let's get down to business. Tell me about the suitors. How many are there? How are they armed? How are we going to 
unarm them, and what's our plan? He lays everything out and gets right down to business. Um, now, in this uh, communication that we've seen between Odysseus and Athena, we've seen this kind of sly, careful way that they come back and forth, but we're only just now getting introduced uh, to the real secret communication that's going to be happening in these closing books. That's the one between Odysseus and Penelope. Eumaeus is off, and remember the journey that he's off on, he's going to bring a message from this stranger that's washed up on shore to Penelope. Eumaeus will be a shuttle back and forth, bringing messages between Penelope and Odysseus at first. Soon enough, Odysseus is going to have his chance to make his own case, make his own pitch to Penelope. Uh, we'll see that the lying will continue. Uh, he's not about to just waltz right in and say, hi, honey, I'm home. Uh, that doesn't work so well. We've seen uh, that in Agamemnon's case. Uh, and he's going to have to make his way, though, more subtly and more slyly to Penelope. We're also going to need to keep an eye on what Penelope knows. Uh, it's not a simple case of her not quite knowing what's happening. There are some points in her uh, narration and her story of how the events are, are coming that make us wonder about how much Penelope knows and when she knows it. Uh, it seems like she's uh, moving along this course of events uh, not just as a passive uh, player but as a very active player. Uh, she uh, makes an entrance now in this next part of the epic, uh, hears that there was some plot against her son, comes down and scolds uh, the suitors, and at that point after she drops her bombs and, and lays down some nasty words against the suitors, she disappears and goes upstairs and goes to sleep. We'll notice that Penelope does a lot of this in the coming book. She'll come down, make some statements, go upstairs, I've got the vapors, I've got to go to sleep. When she does this kind of disappearing act though, uh, watch out because oftentimes something has gone on in the messes that she, ju she's just laid down. Someone's overheard something that she intended or it's hard to tell um, and it's going to carefully, subtly uh, move this back and forth. Um, that uh, subtleness that uh, Odysseus is uh, conveying through his own techniques is going to be uh, met with a similar kind of an even more, uh, an even deeper uh, kind of subtleness, caution, and circumspectness uh, in the figure of Penelope. <laughs>